Today we're going to learn a little bit more about the rule of capture and, and in particular some of the limits on the rule of capture. But we'll talk a little bit about storing natural gas as well. So we'll start in your book with People's Gas versus Tyner, Indiana, 1892. And this is on page 92 in your books. Now this case is a little bit fun because this involves somebody uh, sending explosives down wells. And you know, you may have been surprised when we learned about fracking to learn that sending, having controlled explosions under the ground was one of the key innovations in the fracturing process. But that's something that people have been doing for a long time. Because as you may remember, I said that people have often known that if you could crack up rocks, sometimes you get more oil and gas from it. And this was often done in the past just by less precise methods. And we'll take a look at those. So in this case, Peoples had completed this natural gas well that was just 200 feet from the Tyner's residence. And Peoples wanted to shoot the well. What shooting the well meant was basically sending explosives down it. So you could have a lot of different methods. Let me just skip ahead here and show you some of the methods. So one method is you see that like little house that's circled up there and the suggestion is, well, you could have a torpedo as it's called there, uh, drop, down the, drop down the well and that would uh, explode and cause uh, more oil and gas to be produced. So that's a relatively extreme solution. It was more commonly used was nitroglycerin. And so I've got a picture of a guy pouring uh, nitroglycerin down, down the well uh, right here on the right of your screen. And that could be an extremely dangerous process. So I'm just gonna read the short excerpt from the American Oil and Gas Historical Society's history of shooters, or these are sort of early frackers. Applied legally or illegally, by 1868, nitroglycerin was preferred to black powder despite its frequently fatal tendency to detonate accidentally. A flame or spark would not explode nitroglycerin readily, but the chap who struck it a hard rap might as well avoid trouble among his heirs by having his will written out in a cigar box order to hold such fragments as his weeping relatives could pick from the surrounding district. Uh, that's from 1896, and it gives you a sense of how dangerous it was uh, to do this kind of shooting of a well. So well, you know, what does the court have to say about it here? Well, maybe it's not a surprise. Tyner sought an injunction, and the, you know, this question is, well, can you shoot it to capture more gas? And in you know, part because it's so close to the, uh, to the Tyner's house, the answer is no, they were able to get an injunction. Um, now, it does say, you know, the, the problem here isn't that this would allow people to capture more natural gas. If it was just a question of capturing more natural gas, that would be covered by the rule of capture. But the point is, the fact that you can capture oil and gas doesn't give you a right to damage somebody's property. It does mean that often you can take oil and gas from their property. You can't do other damage, you know, as here would be caused by uh, setting off explosions next to the Tyner's residence. All right, so that's one limit on the rule of capture. Ronsky versus Sun Oil Company describes another one, and it relates to this concept of correlative rights, which we've discussed. Now, this is a case from Michigan in 1979. Uh, it's on page 96. But, so what happened here is that Ronsky owned land within a field that was also drilled by Sun, but production was limited to 75 barrels a day. We'll talk more about these production limits over time, but they're extremely common in oil and gas, and they serve multiple purposes. But one of the purposes is to protect the reservoir that the oil and gas is in. Because if you remember, that oil and gas is in a reservoir where that oil and gas is bubbled up from deep in the earth and is trapped against a cap rock. And if you just put one well down, or just a couple, it, the oil and gas will tend to flow up to the surface because that's where it wanted to get anyway. But if you puncture it with lots of holes, or if you pump too fast, all of a sudden that orderly process of getting the oil and gas to the surface doesn't work as well, and you may not be able to recover as much of that oil and gas. You know, we know that in early oil and gas wells, often you know, over 90% of the oil was left in the ground because they punctured it too much. And if you do a very careful job and use some of the methods that you've read about in your text, water flooding, et cetera, we'll talk more about these during the course, you can get above 50%. So it can make a huge difference if you produce systematically and uh, gradually versus too rapidly. So in this field, production was regulated to 75 barrels per day and Sun violated the restriction. But their defense was, well, hey, you know, it's just the rule of capture. The whole point is that we can pump as much as we want, even if it, uh, you know, produces 
some of our neighbor's oil. But here the court says, no, you know, not only do you lose, son, we're going to apply the harsh rule because you knew this was not okay. Because the rule of capture includes the concept of correlative rights, which is that you can't have wasteful production, which is to say you can't produce so fast that it damages things for everybody. If you produce and you produce some of your neighbor's oil, that's fine and good. But if you're producing so fast that it damages the reservoir so nobody can get oil, that's a problem. That violates other parties' correlative rights. And one thing we'll see is that those correlative rights, which were kind of ill-defined in common law, we didn't know exactly how fast you could pump, they end up being defined by states that say, you know what, here's how much you get to drip to produce per day. In this case, it was 75 barrels per day. All right, this correlative rights doctrine, mineral owner has a duty to other owners to exercise its right to capture the rule of capture in a non-negligent, non-wasteful way. So without damaging the reservoir that everybody is getting oil and gas from. So you can take the oil and gas out, but not if you're doing so in a way that limits, uh, that, you know, limits total recovery from that oil and gas reservoir. And violation, as we saw in this Ronsky case, violation of conservation law or rules can be per se a violation of the correlative rights doctrine. Because remember, correlative rights say, can't be wasteful, and if the state is saying it's wasteful to produce more than 75 barrels a day, then what you've done is violated everybody else's correlative rights. They're correlative because they correlate to each other. Everybody producing from the same field has those rights with respect to each other, which is that they have the right that the other folks will not, they can go ahead and produce, but they can't produce in a wasteful way. And one of the ways that we would say is wasteful is if it violates these conservation laws, which are designed to maximize total oil and gas production. All right, one more limit on the rule of capture, which is from the case of Champlin versus Western Bridge, which is an Oklahoma case from 1979 on page 100. Uh, this is, is sort of somebody who took the rule of capture maybe a little bit, a little bit too seriously, or maybe uh, maybe not seriously enough. Well, we can you can decide what you think, but. Western Bridge owned the surface rights, so basically just owned the surface next to Champlin's storage of refined oil products. So Champlin had all these refined oil products, which means things that you make out of crude oil, like gasoline, jet fuel, naphtha, all those like lubricants we've talked about. Anything, all of those parts of the oil that have been broken down, it was storing those. And there was a leak. There was a leak in those tanks on uh, Champlin's property, and it migrated over onto Western Bridge's property. And Western Bridge said, okay, wait, rule of capture. We got this figured out. So we're going to just take this. Uh, the, in fact, Western Bridge's president collected all that, all those refined products and sold them. So you say, look, it's just the rule of capture. That oil was out there, came onto our land. We took it, no problem, right? Well, uh, that is not what the court concluded. The court concluded it had to, it had to give it back. Champlin potentially might be liable for, you know, for, uh, for a nuisance or a tort by, by polluting uh, Western Bridge's land, but it still is Champlin's oil. And you know, there, the doctrine, there's really kind of a corollary to the rule of capture, which remember rule of capture is about originally with animals. Like if you capture the fox, it's yours from Pearson versus Post. Well, there is a, uh, there is a, doctrine that sort of relates to this. Well, what if somebody captures it and then it escapes again? And that's called uh, animus revertendi. And what it says is, look, if it's a wild animal and it's captured, as long as it remains wild, you know, you don't have any ownership, right, if it escapes again. So if one fisherman caught a fish and then it jumps out of his net or jumps off of his line and you catch it, the first fisherman can't say it belongs to them. But if that fisherman has done something, has domesticated that fish, uh, probably unlikely, but you can imagine a fox maybe being domesticated. There's like, uh, you know, I definitely follow Instagram accounts of domesticated foxes, it's possible. Um, there's also like a Russian experiment, which you guys can Google on domesticated foxes. So there's lots of, there are ways to do it. If you've invested the time to change it from that wild animal into a domesticated animal, well, then, even if it escapes, it still remains yours. And so maybe there's an analogy here where that oil has been, you know, it was that wild crude oil, and it was refined into those products like gasoline and jet fuel, et cetera, that, uh, 
that were more valuable. And so maybe that's like domesticating the oil. So you can think about whether that's kind of a limit on the rule of capture or otherwise. But the point is, once you've produced that oil and gas and used it for your own use, it's no longer subject to the rule of capture. Okay, this becomes actually relevant because uh, when we think about storage of natural gas, because remember oil, you know, one of the reasons that it created the modern world is because it's so, has so much energy, is so dense, and it also is so easy to transport and store. I mean, you can move it by pipeline, but you can also move it by truck. You can move it by rail. You can move it by ship, by barge. You know, in the early days, the reason we measure oil in barrels is because it was initially stored in what people had at hand, which was whiskey barrels. So initially, the reason we still talk about barrels of oil today is it was stored in whiskey barrels and then it was put on, uh, it was carried by Teamsters. The original Teamsters, you know, big union, was from just people by on horse, uh, with horse carriages, pulling these barrels of oil from the fields in Pennsylvania. And so, um, so oil is really easy to transport. By contrast, natural gas is a gas. It's extremely hard to transport because you have to have an airtight container that won't allow it to leak away. And so what that means is when you produce natural gas from the ground, sometimes if there's not a market for it right now, place that it can be used, the very next thing you have to do with it is pump it right back into the ground to store somewhere else. And you wanna store it until it's needed because you, know, you could buy a giant airtight building to store it in, but that's expensive. And so it turns out it's just very expensive to store and to transport natural gas, uh, more so than uh, for oil. And so that means that whenever we talk about natural gas, the, one of the big challenges is transport and storage. And we're gonna talk a couple about some of the other uh, implications of that as well. So um, that means that, you know, obviously when you're storing that natural gas back in the earth, you don't want somebody coming and drilling into it and pulling it up, your neighbor pulling it up and saying, hey, it's mine now. So that becomes one of the sort of complicated uh, rule of capture questions. But just to look at practically how that natural gas is stored, uh, let me show you the three basic ways that it's stored. So one, you know, and the one that we talked about is sort of depleted oil and gas field. So after you've you know, extracted all that oil and gas, then you can just actually go ahead and pump natural gas in to use when you need it, all right? And you will see, you know, in places that have a lot of natural gas storage as well as natural gas production, you'll sometimes see these sort of valves above ground that are for, uh, are for that. Another option is to, uh, to use salt formations, which are great for storing natural gas. Some of those salt formations actually did have oil and gas originally, but even if they didn't, they can be used to store natural gas because they're highly impermeable. That is, things can't flow through them. Then, of course, you could have a depleted aquifer. That's more common in parts of the country that don't have good salt formations under the ground or don't have depleted oil and gas fields because they've never had much oil and gas production. So if you look around the country, what you'll see is that, you know, a lot of those places that have had uh, in, you can see the upside down brown triangle is old oil and gas fields that are now used for natural gas storage. And you can see that's all over some of the big oil and gas producing regions, both currently and historically. Uh, you can see that in the Midwest where they need natural gas for heating and everything, but they don't really have that much traditionally oil and gas production. They often are using depleted aquifers to store that natural gas that used to hold water, now holds natural gas. And then you can see that on the US Gulf Coast, where they have a lot of uh, salt formations, they're able to store natural gas there. So it, the method of storage really differs around the country. Of course, the other challenge with natural gas is transporting it. And so, you know, one thing you may not realize is that the whole U.S. and particularly here in Texas uh, is just crisscrossed with natural gas pipelines. And that's the reason that the US has the world's biggest natural gas market. We have a lot of resources, but we've also built the pipelines to get those resources to market. So you might have wondered, why is it called natural gas anyway? Uh, the reason it's called natural gas is because it's in contrast to manufactured gas. 
Natural gas has always been thought of as really wonderful because it burns cleanly in your house, right? You don't want to burn uh, oil or coal in your house. You better be really well ventilated if you are. Obviously, that can be very dangerous. Natural, everybody, lots of people burn natural gas in their house, and it's not a problem because it burns so cleanly. So people always wanted it in cities for cooking, for heating, et cetera. But it used to be impossible, just engineering-wise, to get that natural gas from the fields where it was created all the way to the cities that needed it. What happened is that as they developed you know, good steel pipelines that could be completely airtight, there was a huge development of natural gas pipelines. And these natural gas pipelines now crisscross the United States and are the reason that we have clean burning natural gas in so much of the US. Now, one, what you can see on this map is a contrast between interstate and intrastate pipelines. So you can see in places that where a lot of the production happens, like Oklahoma and Texas, you have a lot of these intrastate pipelines in red. And then you see a lot of interstate pipelines covering the longer distances, you know, to the Midwest, you know, sending uh, natural gas from Texas over to the East Coast, et cetera. Those are in blue. So those are what the blue and red pipelines mean. Red, intrastate, blue, interstate. All right. The other thing I wanted to show you, so I'm just going to zoom in a little bit of that map here on the right side, which is the U.S. Northeast. And you can see um, there's not a ton of uh, a, not a ton of pipelines there, and that has proven to be a problem in recent years because twice, uh, you know, we talked about all in the U.S., there's this incredible increase in production in Western Pennsylvania uh, from the Marcella Shale of a lot more natural gas. And so that means most of the U.S. experiences some of the lowest cost natural gas in the world. So we have this clean fuel that is available to us for very, very little. But unfortunately, just a couple hundred miles down, uh, the, down the road, uh, you know, on I-90 in Massachusetts and New York, you sometimes have the most expensive natural gas in the world. And you can see that here in 2014, that there was a cold snap where people needed more natural gas in New England. And what happened is that the natural gas prices in uh, New York, basically, and you know, near Boston, they went to uh, they were five or six times higher than what it was in the rest of the country. So just down the road. So just a hundred, you know, a couple hundred miles away, you have prices that are five or six times greater, 30 or $25 per million BTUs. And you might imagine, well, okay, if I could pick it up in Western Pennsylvania, why don't I just set it to, you know, Boston or Massachusetts, Boston or New York, which are so close and get five or six times the price. The problem is, that of course you need a pipeline to do that and a pipeline takes a long time to build. So if it was oil, you would never see this difference in prices between you know, short markets because people would just get on a truck, throw some oil in the back and bring it to New York. Here, that doesn't happen with natural gas because you need that long-term infrastructure like those natural gas pipelines and other infrastructure like liquefied natural gas that we're gonna talk about uh, later in the course to get that natural gas to market. So that means there can be, you know, oil prices tend to equalize. We talk about a global price of oil, even though there are differences, because it does cost money to ship oil around the world. But uh, natural gas prices vary a lot. And that's what I want you to see in this last thing here. I don't expect you to be able to read all of those uh, different places, but those are natural gas prices around the world. And you can see they easily vary by five, you know, four or five times. And sometimes you see big spikes, because what happens is, if all the natural gas is spoken for, people need it for heating. It's what provides our power. It's also what our manufacturing facilities run on. And so if all of a sudden there's a shortage, everybody bids up the price for the little that's available. And that's what happened in New York and Boston, frequently happens in Europe and Asia. And so that's why natural gas prices tend to vary a lot more than oil prices, and especially tend to vary geographically. So when somebody asks what the price of natural gas is, there's not really one answer. It depends on where in the world you are. That's also true with oil, but they're closer together, so it's easier to use the simplification of talking about a world oil price. All right, so that's the, the preview that we need to talk about this Texas American versus Citizens Bank case, and this is who owns that natural gas that has been now injected into an underground storage reservoir. Now, the key precedent, precedent from, in this case, is this Hammonds, which said, well, look, it's no trespass because the gas returned to nature. It's like that fish that you caught 
well, you just threw it back, so therefore, uh, so therefore it's wild and anybody can catch it. Um, you know, in theory, that would mean that Amits could go ahead and produce the gas herself. So your neighbor, you're storing the natural gas underground in one of those depleted reservoirs, and your neighbor drills into their part of the reservoir and just produces all of your natural gas. So, uh, so I think you know that's the mistake that the uh, court is recognizing. Um, one complication here is what does happen if your natural gas actually just migrates onto another's land? Uh, does that are you somehow liable for it because you know you're really they're storing it for you? Should you pay them something for it? And the states have different ways of dealing with that problem.